Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our parent webinar. Today, we're going to be talking all about practicing fine motor skills. My name is Angela Ochoa, and I'm going to be introducing you to some of the topics that we're going to be talking about this evening. Um, I am the Director of Occupational Therapy here at MEBE, and I wanted to give you guys some tips and tricks at home to help support your child and your family when you're practicing things like fine motor skills in the home. We know right now that during um, distance learning, and other things like that. A lot of these skills that children were learning in the classroom are now being done in the home. So I'm excited tonight to share with you some, um, some strategies and some ways to address these skills for your child in order to support some success and help them with these challenging but important developmental skills. So as I mentioned before, my name is Angelo Ochoa. I am the Clinical Director of Occupational Therapy at MEBE. Uh, to give you some background on myself, I am an occupational therapist. I'm newest to the MEBE team here. I joined MEBE here, um, in November of 2019. So I'm very happy um, when I joined MEBE, I was um, lucky enough to be able to start the OT practice and bring our OT um, program to what uh, services maybe is currently providing. Um, I'm born and raised in San Diego, California. I got my degree in occupational therapy, my master's at San Jose State um, about 12 years ago. And I've been practicing in pediatrics ever since um, because I'm born and raised in San Diego. I um, left San Jose and came right back home to where my friends and family are. So I'm really excited to share some um, information with you guys this evening. To give you guys a little bit of background about MEBE, MEBE is all about being me. What we do at MEBE is we provide uh, research-based services for children um, with a variety of developmental diagnoses, whether they're on the autism spectrum or have other developmental delays. We provide um, research-based strategies with personal attention. So the idea is, is that if your child is coming in receiving ABA, speech, or OT, their program is going to be individualized and specific to meet your child's needs. Um, as I mentioned before, we provide occupational therapy. Certainly, we also provide ABA or applied behavioral analysis services, and we also provide speech and language therapy. We're fortunate enough to be able to provide both in-clinic services as well as in-home services and telehealth. Um, our locations we provide services are in San Diego. That's our, um, our headquarters is based here and that's where we started. But we're very fortunate and grateful because we get to also provide services in other areas as well. Los Angeles and the Bay Area rounding out our California uh, services. And we also provide um, ABA speech and OT at our Seattle location. And we're very excited because we just added Denver and Phoenix this past year. So um, if you'd like some more information about the services we provide, you can find us at Maybe Family com. Our main phone number is right there. And um, of course, you can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Mebe Family. So our topics for today, we are going to be discussing what are fine motor skills? What are the skills that we're talking about when we're referring to things like fine motor skill and development? Why are fine motor skills important to OT? Why do OTs focus on this? And why is this a really important developmental skill um, that's essential and vital for everything that we do and target in occupational therapy? We're also going to talk about the role of posture and upper body strength and how that supports our fine motor skill development. We're going to talk a little bit about the different grasp patterns and the grasps that we use to complete specific tasks. Um, a big topic right now because distance learning is happening and because a lot of these skills that your child is working on are happening in the home, we're going to also talk about handwriting. Handwriting in, is in and of itself something that we could target in our own parent webinar, but for today we are going to talk a little bit about some strategies in the home that you can um, support uh, your child uh, when completing these activities and how fine motor skills specifically can impact handwriting performance. And then of course, as I said, activities at home, that's gonna be the big takeaway from today, we hope. So first we're gonna discuss fine motor skills. What are fine motor skills? A, a clear definition really is um, the small movements of the hands, wrist and fingers. So whatever our hands are doing require a level of strength 
coordination um, to manipulate our fingers and things that we're holding in our hand and moving our wrists and positioning our forearm, forearm to do a lot of important daily tasks. Now in occupational therapy, we're looking at a lot of the, as you can see here, the skills for the jobs of living. What, means, what that means is OTs are working on daily living activities among other things. So skills that children are participating in might be things like school related activities where we're looking at things like cutting with scissors or manipulating Play-Doh, putting together um, blocks, um, creating hammer, um, this hammer and nails activity is a perfect um, example of crafts that maybe little ones might be doing, um, but also arts and crafts or things related to academics in the classroom. And then certainly getting dressed. All of these skills require fine motor skills. Our hands and our wrists and our fingers need to work together in order to complete these activities. And for some of our kiddos, it's very challenging because maybe these skills haven't quite yet been developed or maybe they could use some refining or maybe we just need a lot of practice. So when we're talking about things about supporting fine motor development, occupational therapists are gonna be looking at a couple of different things. First, we're gonna look at hand strength and coordination. So, uh, so quite, quite literally, I guess, when we're talking about hand strength, it's the muscles in our hands and the muscles that support our hands to move them and coordinate them to do things like hold a pencil, tie our shoes, cut with scissors. We can't focus specifically just alone on the, the skills of our hands without also targeting things like upper body strength. You'll see in the next slide, we um, there's a focus too about how our upper body strength, things like our shoulders, our back muscles, our core, um, our you know all other our neck muscles. These are all supporting our ability to use our hands successfully. And then lastly, if we're working on fine motor skills, we're also gonna be looking at posture, our position, the way we hold ourselves, the position and posture we find ourselves when completing these activities can support or inhibit our success with fine motor tasks. So we're gonna be talking a little bit about those things today. This slide is a, one that I mentioned when we're talking about fine motor movements, you see here at the bottom, it's kind of a hierarchy of skill. So what we're gonna be looking at is shoulder stability. Are our shoulders strong enough to be stable for us to isolate the movements of our elbow and our forearm? Our forearm being this, our elbow being this guy right here. <laughs> um, and then wrist stability. So if everything is strong and stable in our shoulders and our forearms, then we can move our wrists. Finally, it gets us to fine motor skills. And these are the precise movements of our hands that allow us to do the things that are really necessary and important and functional. So to give you a quick uh, capture of what we're looking at when we're looking at things like fine motor skills and development, there's different grasp patterns, grasp patterns that are specific to age. So when we're younger, our grasp patterns should be a little bit more gross, where we use our whole hand or several fingers to complete activities. Whereas as we get older, we're completing more complex activities like holding a pencil. So maybe at 10 months of age, we're starting to, in, um, to isolate items between our fingers to work on pinch um, and our pincer grasp, but to work on pinching objects, picking up small things, picking up Cheerios to feed ourselves. As we, as we get older, our expectations are, okay, now we're gonna be using a tool or a writing utensil. So let's take a peek. So at 12 months of age, we're gonna be holding the, the crayon or the pencil with our whole hand. It gets a little bit more um, advanced as we're looking at two to three years of age with a digital pronate grasp, where now we've rotated our hand, our wrist, and our forearm to color. We then um, use our whole hand at three and four eight years um, of age to hold the pencil. So this is when kiddos are stabilizing the pencil with their finger. Let me show you here with the pencil. They're stabilizing the pencils with their fingers, but they're moving the pencil with their shoulder. So these are bigger movements. Um, these are when we're coloring big um, shapes and, and, and drawing lines and coloring um, you know, big areas on the paper. The idea here is that three and four years of age, we should be doing things a little bit larger. So when we start writing um, and forming letters at this age, our letters are much bigger because we're utilizing our our shoulder muscles and other muscles of our arm while our fingers are getting used to holding this writing instrument. And then finally at five and six years of age, we're using our fingers where now we've stabilized the, the, the pencil and now our fingers are moving side to side, front and back in order to, for us to create more precise movements of the fingers to support things like writing letters, cursive writing, writing in smaller 
sections, filling out worksheets, things like that. Gross, uh, certainly grasp patterns, we're also talking about things that are um, different patterns, ways to uh, pick up something with a handle, to throw a ball, um, to pinch um, a key, to turn it in the key in, the, in a doorknob. These are all uh, patterns of, of fine motor development that OTs look at and they be, they're, they're developmental. So it's important to know that if we're having challenges with these particular patterns, like holding a, holding a pencil, an OT might also look at some of these other grasp patterns because they set the foundation for our ability to be successful with our fine motor skills. It's also important to notate here too, that when we're talking about things, especially when we're talking about handwriting, we have to consider handedness. The, the hand that we use, hand dominance, when is that established? I get this question a lot from parents and a lot of other clinicians as well. My child is alternating their hands. They're three years old, but they're using their left hand sometimes to color. They're using their right hand sometimes to feed themselves. What's going on here? It's important to know that hand dominance is developed between a pretty sizable window. So from three to five years of age is when we start establishing our hand dominance. So by five years of age, which is what this little one's holding the pencil right here, when we're writing more consistently, that's when we really should have established for the most part, a well-established hand dominance, right or left hand should be using, should be holding the pencil or the marker or the, the, the objects that we're manipulating. You should be using it with your left or right hand most of the time and not alternating as frequently. We know that a lot of our children, especially children on the autism spectrum and other developmental delays have this particular challenge where they may not develop handedness until much later. So it's important for us as OTs to look at the grasp patterns and also which hand we're using. Um, and then encouraging, if it's one hand that we should be using or more often, let's encourage that hand to be doing that so we can develop the fine motor and grasp patterns that are essential for that hand to be successful. So when we're targeting things like hand strength, that's one of the tenets when we're looking at things like fine motor skills. We're gonna do activities that require strengthening of the muscles of our hands, the inside of our hands. So things like using um, uh, therapy putty or play-doh squeezing stretching twisting pinching these are all ways in which we develop the skills within our hands and create endurance uh, to do some of these more precise activities so you might see um in occupational therapy or some suggestions we might have for you is try some grip strength activities with either therapy putty which is they're using here things like play-doh or things that are resistive you'll see here a lot of times um these kinds of fidget toys these little these um, balls with the nets over them, those will create a lot of resistance. So when you squeeze, you're really putting a lot of tension on the inside muscles of the hand in order to, to contract those muscles. And when you squeeze them, make these really cool patterns. What we find though, is that these particular um, uh, uh, balls, the, the, the grippy balls are really resistive. They're actually really challenging for a lot of our younger kiddos, three, four, five years of age. So I might recommend something that's a little less resistive and a little bit easier to squeeze. You're still targeting those muscles, but instead of having to, you know, really use two hands or ask mom, I can't do this anymore or have someone else do it. Try something that's a little less resistive. Things like, um, uh, the little balls that have maybe the water balls in them, or there's these little squishy guys where you squeeze their head and eyes bug out. It's really motivating, it's really fun, and it gets kids engaged to activate those muscles that they may not otherwise be utilizing. When we're talking about hand fine motor skills, we're also talking about hand coordination exercises. Things that require our hands to do something more precise than turning muscles on to squeeze or turning them off or extending your muscles um, to do some of the other exercises that we might've been talking about in the last slide. This slide is in hand manipulation activities. So things like using tweezers. We're gonna take um, long handled tweezers a lot of times and pick up small items. So we're gonna utilize maybe these three fingers which are really important and necessary when we graduate to skills such as holding a pencil. So we're gonna use maybe tweezers to work on coordinating these muscles to pick up an object and put it into something. Um, for our younger kiddos, we might do things like um, marble races where our marble towers where they have to um, drop marbles 
into a tower or put things together. So it's not just working on strength, but also how do I coordinate the muscles of my hands to do more precise things? Um, things like these coin activities are really fantastic for our little guys to practice this lateral pinch. For our older kiddos, um, maybe we'll use connect four. So instead of this lateral pinch to put in the, the coins, we're now gonna use our more precise pincer grasp to pick up the coins and put them in the connect four. Um, things like beading um, activities are a great way to practice um, in hand manipulation and coordination type things. When we're doing um, tweezers activities, this is a really common exercise that we might give kiddos a lot of times. And a lot of parents have questions as to when is the right time for uh, my child to start doing exercises like this. And usually um, age two seems pretty young and it is to start these things, but we can use for, for age two, we might, instead of using these really precise handles, we might use things like tongs, you know, where you use them in the kitchen. So instead of using, um, so, you know, instead of using these precise things, maybe we're going to pick up small cotton balls and pick them up and put some, put some things or pick up small stuffed animals with our tongs and use our whole hand to open and close. And as we get older, um, after age two, three, four, five years of age, then we can graduate to something like these tweezer activities. They're really phenomenal for helping set your child up for holding the pencil or feeding utensils or things like that but not just targeting that skill. It's working on developing the coordination of the hand and the fingers in order to pick things up and manipulate them appropriately. Sometimes for um, some of our kiddos, I'll also do things like finger aerobics, where we're gonna do activities where all of our fingers need to touch, or we're gonna pretend that we're a bird and we have to hook our thumbs and then utilize our fingers in such a way that it looks like we're a bird. Lots of really great ways to work on uh, hand coordination and um, ways in which to even warm up our muscles before we're supposed to be doing things like homework um, or schoolwork in this case at home. We talked a little bit about how our upper body strength will also support our fine motor skills. So, you know, maybe for adults, we might do activities like push ups, or in this instance, we might have an adaptive push up where someone is uh, utilizing their weight bearing through their hands, pushing down and up. For some of our kiddos, we need to come up with something that's a little bit more motivating. So even though this is a great activity for some of our kids that can tolerate it, maybe our seven, eight, nine, 10 year olds that can do this type of thing, we might need to put use um, an activity more like this. So we're modifying this activity to allow for the child, they're still weight bearing through their hands over a ball. So it's giving them some support if it's really hard to maintain this position without it. And then instead of reaching down and pushing back up like you would in a traditional sit up or excuse me, push up, this child is putting together a puzzle. So if they have to reach for the puzzle piece, reach, shift their weight, maintain this, um, this, this strong posture and position. And it's a fantastic way to target these muscles and work on the upper body strength while also uh, playing a functional fun game. Some other fun upper body strengthening activities can be things like crab walking or donkey kicks or bear walking. I love to do these types of activities with a lot of my clients where we might roll a dice and the dice has different uh, animal walks on them and it lands on crab walking. So now we've got a crab walk um, around a target or maybe we'll play like crab walk soccer where we all get in this position and then we, we stabilize the ball on our tummies and then use um, and then crab walk all the way to put the soccer ball into the net. These are great ways to allow your child opportunities to weight bear, build these muscles, but in fun um, avenues and also address things like endurance. Um, crab walking, donkey kicking, bear walking, this can be tricky for a lot of kiddos. So maybe if they're not quite yet able to do this independently, we might do something like a wheelbarrow walk. So it's a similar activity. We're weight bearing through our hands. We're building up muscles in our, in our shoulders, our neck, our trunk. And then by giving a little bit of postural support, this, this person right here is holding at the tummy. You can hold your child at the, the feet to help them walk. And then that way they're shifting their weight. They're building up their, their strength in their shoulders, which is ultimately going to support fine motor skills. So a lot of times I'll have parents come to me and say, I really want my child to do, to hold their pencil. They, they have a really bad grasp at school. The teacher is describing um, that they're having a hard time keeping up with handwriting activities. And I might give some strategies or suggestions to do these types of skills. What we wanna do is build these muscles in addition to the muscles and the coordination of our hand. Um, some other things too, is things like planks, 
where we could do like maybe a modified plank where our focus is we're going to be working on not just the weight bearing through the shoulders and the forearms, but we're also weight bearing, we're also, you know, activating our postural muscles, our, our tummy muscles to contract, to build core strength, which is another tenet of building your fine motor skills. So of course, now we're also talking about posture. We have a few other um, webinars that talk a lot about posture and positioning at home to help support your child's focus and attention and ability to complete uh, activities at home, both homework and distance learning related activities. I highly encourage you to check out those webinars if you haven't. Um, the focus with this particular webinar is going to be on the fine motor piece. So a lot of our kiddos, when we're talking about things like posture, we want to make sure that we're, we're really aware of what postures are going to be supportive and inhibiting of creating some of this uh, or developing these fine motor skills. A lot of children assume this kind of W sitting posture. There's a lot of reasons why um, both occupational therapists, physical therapists, and maybe some other clinicians are really going to um, encourage you to facilitate other postures and positions for your child. W sitting puts a lot of undue stress on some joints. It gives us a really unnatural posture in a lot of different ways. Um, kiddos tend to assume this W sitting posture because the, with their legs being outspread, like you see here, um, it gives her a wider base of support. But what it does is it eliminates those subtle postural muscles that we require when we're sitting or we're doing other movement activities to engage. So a W sitting posture for a lot of different reasons is, a, is something that we try to avoid as best we can. Ultimately, our goal, if we're sitting on the floor, is to achieve a posture similar to this. If we're doing um, this crisscross um, position or this tailor sitting position, this is going to be much better posturally for your child. But very often, if your child is doing this W position, switching to a crisscross position is very challenging. It puts a lot of, it's a big stretch for their child, your child, because ultimately what it's doing is they're used to having their hips turn inward and rest their, their bodies down. The crisscross position requires your hips to turn outward and your body to sit up. It can be challenging. So we know that this isn't something that we can automatically go to all the time, which is why we might look for alternative postures. Things like a ring sitting position. So you can see this little one's um, feet are touching, the, the bottoms of their feet are touching and they're not crossed over as, as much here. That'll eliminate some of that stretch on the hips and encourage your child to sit a little bit more functionally this way. Some other things to consider too, if crisscross position is too tricky or something that you wanna try something else. Side sitting is a great alternative. Long sitting, you can see right here. So uh, this little one is long sitting where um, his feet are out in front of him. That creates a lap <laughs> for his book. And then he has some um, support, but with the fence that's behind him. So some options there. Um, if, we, if we are ultimately having your child sitting on the floor for a lot of activities, and sometimes that's what we need to do <laughs> because that's just where we're going to get our work done. Um, but maybe W sitting or some of these other postures are, are, are challenging or can be challenging. You might consider um, a lap desk like this little one is using. Um, ultimately, we would love for children to sit in this really beautiful posture where they're sitting at this 90, 90, 90 position where their hips are positioned at 90 degrees, knees are positioned at 90 degree, degrees, and our feet are firmly planted on the floor and our ankles are at 90 degrees. This is a great posture and position if we're sitting at the table, but very often that's not always possible. So um, some additional things to consider when we're looking at this is um, some ways in which we can support them as best as possible. So maybe we need to put a cushion under their, under their bottom or sit them upright if they're sitting at the dining room table, maybe putting um, a box or a stool or a chair underneath their feet so their feet don't dangle. We have a lot, a, a lot more additional kind of postural suggestions in some of our other webinars. So I highly recommend going to check them out if you haven't already. Ways that we can support fine motor skills is we will oftentimes create and establish some adaptations. Pencil grips are a great solution for some kiddos who have a hard time holding the pencil as we discussed before, where we want it to rest very firmly and nicely in our hand, our fingers are positioned well, and we're set up in a way where we can write with our fingers and move them adequately. 
sometimes kiddos have a really hard time with doing this. So we might want to create, um, we might want to give them some supports that will help position their fingers a little bit more appropriately. I really like the grotto grip as one um, great solution. I will say that there's about a hundred, I would, I would guesstimate. I think there may be less than that, but let's say a hundred. I would say there's, there's so many grips, pencil grips that are out there and available. These are just a few that I like, um, but there's a lot available. I strongly recommend checking in with your OT if you haven't already, or certainly giving us a call at Mebi so we can help support you and kind of best come up with the, with, um, the best pencil grip for you because there's so many out there. The grotto grip is one great grip. There's also a claw grip that has little individual sections for your fingers to rest while you hold the pencil. We can make grips. Um, this one in particular is using a combination of therapy putty, clay, and rubber band. Great options too. Um, Therapyshop.com is a really great resource for some of my favorite pencil grips. Amazon has the best deals, but Therapy Shop might also support you with narrowing in some of your focus when it comes to coming up with adaptations. Some other ways that we adapt um, when we're talking about things like fine motor skills um, that are, might be having some challenges. We will use, we will break crayons or make the crayons smaller. By making smaller crayons, what we automatically encourage, as you can see here with this little one, they're using their fingertips. A lot of our kiddos are going to hold on to crayons with their whole hand if they have the entire crayon to hold on to. So by breaking the crayon and using smaller utensils, that will oftentimes better position their fingers to color, to draw, to write. So we might make those really simple suggestions. Um, there's also adaptive writers like, um, uh, like this particular uh, pencil that positions our fingers and, and spaces them just so that takes some of the, the pressure off of our wrists. A lot of our older kiddos, especially if they have a, a really tight grasp on a pencil or they have a really poor grasp or they're, they're positioning their fingers and they're holding really, really hard, we we'll might complain about wrist and thumb pain, their forearms fatigue easily. So one thing we might utilize is some adaptive pencils to support that, eliminate some of the stress on the joints and allow for ease of use. Um, we also look at things for fine motor skills like cutting. There's adaptive scissors that we'll often use. These particular scissors are a great option. Um, Therapy Shop is a place that you can locate these. They're on Amazon as well, um, where it's scissors that are more like traditional scissors, but they have this little spring in them that you can engage or disengage. And when you engage the spring, it automatically helps the scissors open and close so that when um, so kids don't have to focus on the opening and the closing they can focus on just the closing because it'll help spring it open close spring it open that allows kids that have limited fine motor skills or fatigue easily with cutting this can be a really good um, bridge to using more traditional scissors um, we also use things like slant boards in ot if our um, kiddo is having a hard time coloring on a flat horizontal surface, sometimes bringing the surface up in a reclined position towards them positions their fingers in such a better way that will allow them to, to hold the pencil in a more successful way when doing things like coloring and writing. Um, this is one that you can purchase, but certainly I've made plenty of DIY uh, uh, slant board uh, out of just binders and some paper clips. So lots of good options there. Um, and certainly if you go to therapyshop.com, it'll really help narrow the field because there's so many things that are out there. So now we're talking about handwriting. So as I said before, handwriting really could be its own webinar and it might be, <laughs> but some things to note about handwriting is once it's based on development, we're gonna talk a lot about how OTs look at handwriting. We also need to, to note, handwriting is a very complex skill. From an OT perspective, it handwriting is kind of the penultimate. It's the ultimate goal that we want a lot of our kids to achieve. And if we're looking here at this pyramid of handwriting, we have to make sure that a lot of these other skills are just so in order for us to build on that foundation, which is handwriting. So we need to make sure fine motor skills are intact. There's visual skills, there's sensory skills, there's there's looking at handwriting from a really gross perspective. Can we, can we do more simple forms like lines and shapes? And then can we advance to things like 
lowercase writing and, and, and cursive. And if there's pieces missing there, that's where OT comes in and goes, okay, I think we got to focus on the fine motor skills, the visual motor skills, whatever else that's going on with the goal being that handwriting is going to be our target. Because there's this is a complex skills, there's a lot of different ways to address this. So I'm going to give a couple examples of how we might approach it in an OT session and ways in which you can target this at home to best support your child, because we know handwriting is challenging. And I'm hopeful that by the end of today, we're really going to come up with some strategies that are going to be supportive and um, accessible at home. So first, when we're talking about handwriting, it's important to recognize that handwriting is developmental. Just like we talked about all those different grasp patterns, I don't have the same expectations for a kid that's 10 months old or 12 months old as I do that as kid, that a kiddo is five and six years old. There's a lot of skills that are developed in that time frame that are going to support these more complex skills like handwriting. So in OT, we are almost always going to start with looking at these what we call pre-writing shapes. We are going to look at the uh, vertical lines, horizontal lines, circular lines. Now we're going to look at a cross. Now we've upgraded to, a, to a, um, a square. Ooh, diagonal lines. These are all based on developmental principles that come back to our, our development of vision and our fine motor skills together. So if we're looking at pre-writing skills on um, this kind of developmental continuum, it's important to note the similarities and maybe some of the differences for handwriting. As you can see, when we're younger, th these more complex shapes like diagonals are for our four and a half and older kiddos. Um, and this is what we expect for typical ages to develop, but there's a wide range within that too. Maybe at four and a half years, this is emerging, but it's not there yet. So the way in which we teach letters is going to be in line with these developmental principles. So a lot of times a very common thing that may happen is we start with A. If we're learning letters, if we're learning to write letters, we might start with the letter A. As you can see, A is more complex developmentally because it's got those diagonal lines. So if we're looking at a kiddo that's having a hard time with writing letters, we try and chunk them and, and, and teach them in a way that's going to build off of what they currently do. So if if these diagonals are tricky, if these crosses are tricky, if the circle is tricky, we're going to start with the letters that are much more straightforward. These vertical and horizontal letters, vertical, horizontal. So those are the L's. H, vertical and horizontal. I, vertical and horizontal. So we're going to be, we might be working on targeting letters that are out of the traditional sequence, but are going to build more to more success for children. So it's important for us to know that the, these pre-writing shapes that oftentimes us OTs are really focused on has its, it lends itself to understanding why handwriting can be so tricky and what, and ways in which we can break down handwriting to much more manageable and more successful sequences. So again, on this, uh, exactly what we were just talking about, where we're looking at chunking letters. So there's a really wonderful program that OTs utilize a lot because it was developed by an OT. So it's kind of honed in on this idea of um, using developmental principles to support handwriting. And it's called handwriting without tears. And the idea is, as we can probably all relate to, handwriting can feel very stressful and maybe even even shed some tears. And so the goal with handwriting without tears is to break handwriting down in, in much more digestible and manageable ways so that we can support success that will then build to more success. So in Handwriting Without Tears, they have something really wonderful called Frog Jump Capitals. So you can see if we're learning capital letters, for instance, we're not starting with A, B, C, D, E. This particular program utilizes things like Frog Jump Capitals, capitals where we're going to be using things we're going to be doing things like we're going to form an f so when we write an f we make a big line down and then we frog jump with our pencil up to the top and then we make the lines for f and then an e big line down frog jump with our pencil back to the top to form the e d big line down frog jump back up to the top to form the, the d these are ways where we can we can teach kids specific 
motor sequences that are going to help support them in learning the letters. Because when we're talking about handwriting in OT, we're really looking at formation. And we want to make sure that our letters are, are consistent. And as we know, a lot of our kiddos may be having a hard time writing because they don't form letters consistently. So this comes up with some strategies to support that. In the same way that they do capital letters, the um, Handwriting Without Tears also has a really lovely way to break down lowercase letters. For instance, a magic C. So if we're going to make the letter D, the letter D is a magic C letter. What a magic C is, is you start by making the C. Then we go up like a helicopter, up higher, back down and bump the line. Um, D and B are the most frequently reversed lowercase letters. So what the magic C letters do is they teach you that if D is a magic C lever, letter and you start with forming the C, you'll never make it a B because a B would not be a magic C letter because it doesn't start with the letter C. So that's one great strategy that we might utilize to help support our learning and understanding of these letters. When we're looking at handwriting, from a developmental perspective, we try and teach capital letters first. Capital letters are much more uniform. They require um, much less awareness of how to write things on lines and they are much more straightforward. We know that sometimes this isn't always the case and this is not at all to say that what, if, you're, if you're learning lowercase letters in conjunction with capitals, that that's a bad thing. But if your child is having difficulties with lowercase letters, it could be because we didn't master capitals just yet. So this is one way to target that. So let's learn our capitals first, get that, that foundation. When we're talking about forming letters, we can still learn what the letters look like, but forming letters, let's try, let's try capital first and then graduate to lowercase. Um, so this can be tricky because we also know that reading doesn't follow the same principles. And that's why it's really important to check in with your OT or to, to get OT guidance in this so we can support you with what's going to make the most functional sense for you at home as well. So speaking of handwriting practice at home, there's so many ways to make handwriting fun. And ultimately, we know all of our goals for our kiddos is to write on a line with their pencil. But what we want to do is we recognize that there's so many skills, as we said, that are that are involved with writing. We need to know what the letters look like. We need to be able to copy what the letters look like. We need to have spelling in the back of our mind for some of our older kiddos. We need to know what how lines on a paper work. Um, we need to um, be able to hear what we're hear what's being said and then be able to carry that out with our with our written communication. So it's really important that when we're looking at handwriting, especially these foundational skills, let's focus on letter formation. If we can focus on letter formation, then we've got a much more solid foundation to come up with more complex skills. So letter formation looks a lot of different ways to a lot of different kiddos. So we might do for some of our younger kiddos, create um, some of these um, with the, these dot uh, markers, have children learn how to form letters, but they're going to do it with a dot marker. So they don't have to grab a pencil or a crayon because maybe that's super aversive at this point in time because it's just so hard for them. Let's give them a dot marker. And then we're going to start by learning. This is where the R starts. We start at the top and then we go dot, 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 dot down, <gasps> frog jump back up, dot, dot, dot to the middle and dot, dot, dot out. So that might be one way we might target that. For some of our younger kiddos, we might use things like a pegboard. So we're looking on letter formation, but we're gonna use a pegboard. This particular um, activity also suggests, which I think is brilliant, um, using one of those, um, those, I think it's, I can't remember how many, dice, I guess 26 <laughs> uh, sided dice where they have different letters on them. Roll the dice, form the letter. It takes some of the pressure off when we start presenting some of these fine motor and handwriting activities in novel and unique ways where we ultimately want the goal to be handwriting success in more traditional formats, but sometimes we can't start there. And in this case, we might look at other avenues to practice these things. I really like using Play-Doh and other tactile kind of manipulatives to work on letter formation. We have to roll the Play-Doh out into snakes and then form the Play-Doh. We can do it with, as we did here. Another way to use that tactile input is um, this particular person used uh, colored sand 
and then they're dragging the pencil through the colored sand to make an H. Um, this kiddo right here is doing something similar to this dot, but it's for older kiddos. Now, instead of using dots, they're using a Q-tip, practicing fine motor skills, grasp on the writing utensil, but it's a different writing utensil. It's not a pencil. And then they get to dot, dot, dot their way through. So focusing on where the letter starts and how to form, form them. Once we get a, a consistent um, once we get a consistent pattern established, handwriting's a breeze. It's coming up with this, and sometimes kids don't have this fully established when it's time to graduate to things like writing sentences and paragraphs. Another way to practice um, handwriting at home is come up with a letter of the day. Um, I like to uh, come up with a letter of the day where we're going to be learning. Okay, I don't even know what some of the letters look like. So when we're at the grocery store, we're going to today, everything with the letter P at the grocery store, see how many you can find. You know, there's prego, which is, uh, you know, pasta sauce, ooh, P, pasta. Um, other letters, ooh, this is a capital letter P. This is a lowercase P. This is a P that's kind of in a funky font. You know, sometimes there's interesting logos that might have a cursive or a script font. Teaching kids that letters exist in different ways they're presented is also really helpful when it comes to things like visual processing and perceptual skills. Um, so that's a really fun way to incorporate letter of the day. We're going to practice it at home, but then we're also going to locate it out in their community. We're going to maybe come up with different words that start with that letter or have that letter in them. When we were, when we're watching our favorite show, did you see? That is a pine cone. A oh, pine cone starts with a P. What does a P look like? Let's write it. Um, I really love to incorporate gross motor skills, those big motor movements when practicing handwriting also. If we can get our bodies engaged in it, the input that our body is craving from the environment, and then also practice these skills. So for instance, this, this kiddo is working on making a letter A. So they've got to they've got to maybe walk in a line to form the letter or jump to each space. We're making an A. Then we're going to write the A big and small. Different ways to present it. This kiddo is writing their name with stickers. Name's already written. Let's write it with stickers. We're going to use pasta to write name, our name. You know, whatever we can use at home that's going to support formation and with a fun spin. Ultimately, we know that we want your child to be writing in a more traditional way, but sometimes it's they're just not there yet. So these are ways to embed these, these principles of what we're learning, but in a variety of different ways by, a ta by, by addressing handwriting in a multi-sensory approach, that's going to support their growth even more because you're embedding these patterns into what they're doing and you're solidifying what they're learning across a, a variety of different medium, which I think is truly helpful, especially for kiddos that are avoidant and, but you know, we need a lot of support with. Um, a lot of times for our older kiddos, we have to work on spacing. Spacing between letters and words. Sometimes spacing between letters is too big, or sometimes spacing be between words is too small, and it's really hard to delineate. So I might use a gross motor strategy as every time we're gonna we're gonna write a space, we're gonna jump. That will uh, uh, allow the child to one move because maybe handwriting's tri tricky, but then it really punctuates the idea that a space is a bigger space. So let's jump. That's a big space. Okay, so make sure your spacing is bigger. Oh, let's do a teeny tiny space for the spaces in our words. Inside the words, they should be much smaller. Let's do a little baby jump. Coming up with that physicality could support your child in what's otherwise pretty challenging for them. We also adapt a lot in our um in what it is that we do so if we so we want to target the foundational skills handwriting letter formation letter start um learning what our letters are but we also can we also can come up with really unique ways to adapt for our child um, there's all sorts of adaptive paper a really great resource is printablepaper.net um, in their penmanship section is a really great free resources printable paper for your child um, it has a lot of different styles it could be this type of paper which is kind of that grid paper where you're focusing on spacing like we were just talking about between letters and um and words. So what I like to talk to kids about is um, each letter gets its own room. Don't forget spaces get their own room too. So if we're going to write a, a word that has, or excuse me, a sentence, make sure a space and a letter, they all get their own room. Adapting their paper like this can allow them to see 
this more clearly, we'll allow them to be more successful, and then we can work on ways to phase these things out. Another adaptation I really love when we're looking at um, uh, practicing, especially our lowercase letters, is um, our highlighting paper, our highlighted paper, where um, all of our big letters live in the white part so that maybe our, our capital letters are going to start at the top, but our little lowercase letters, they live in the highlighted part. They live in the yellow. Um, and so starting to delineate really clearly where the yellow is or where the, where the lowercase letters should go and help them organize their page a little bit more successfully. And then this paper also gives much bigger definition between the lines. So there's not confusion. Some of our kiddos have a hard time with seeing these things. Again, we could talk about handwriting so many different ways. Um, but uh, sometimes seeing it on the page feels overwhelming or it's really hard for them to discern what they're supposed to be doing. So adapting your paper like this can be really successful. Um, we'll use gray box paper. This is um, something Handwriting Without Tears does when we're practicing our letters or our words, giving them something that's really clearly with how big or small their letters should be. For some of our kiddos, we might need to use something like dictation and word. They have all these really beautiful ideas, but they can't get them out. And they wanna tell you these stories, but writing it is exhausting. Let's try dictation. Word actually has this as part of their, um, their program. So if you guys use Microsoft Word, um, dictation is an option for some of our kiddos that will write the words. And then you can practice things like proofreading. This isn't a... This isn't in, in lieu of handwriting, but this is to support your child who has a lot of ideas or has a lot of really creative inspiration and wants to say the words, but just can't write them yet. Or typing is challenging, which is a whole other ball game. Um, some of our kiddos, um, maybe we're gonna do things like stamps. There's lots of um, really great ways that we can work on the fundamentals of handwriting, spelling, um, where to place letters on a line but using the stamps to support these skills and eliminating some of the challenges maybe of the fine motor elements of holding the pencil or using a pencil grip that might just not be working. Um, so there's lots of ways that we can adapt things to allow your child to be more successful. That was a whirlwind <laughs> and I really appreciate your time this evening and um, you know, I look forward to hearing from you if we haven't already, and certainly feel free to find us at Maybe Family, both on Instagram and Facebook, and you can, of course, find us at MaybeFamily.com. I appreciate your time this evening. Thank you so much um, for all that you do, and we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Take care.